All right, welcome back to Problem Solver Politics. I am your host, Carden Ellis, with Cody the Oracle. Hey, everybody. And today we're actually going to dive deep a little bit into some tax code and some tax law. Usually this stuff is really kind of boring. We decide not to, you know, uh, go too deep and, and to kind of gloss over it. Um, however, there are times where taxation and where the money flows actually really has a big influence on not just our economy, but who we choose for our presidential candidates. And right now it is a big center of controversy controversy gosh that's the second time this week that i've botched that word anyway it's a big point of controversy between andrew yang elizabeth warren and bernie sanders as to how we tax the public you know you need some taxes in order to fund all of our public things however we've gone off the rail with taxation okay that's that that's just a fact and there's been some proposals as to how we can better do this thing some in my opinion are going to absolutely cripple the american economy and the middle class that means you our viewer others actually i think are a good idea so without burying the lead let's defer to cody and find out what we're talking about there's three plans on the table which one is best uh, yeah, exactly. So we were going to take a look. Uh, actually, this article, it was uh, the National Review, which the National Review is a very conservative publication. Uh, but still, the headline was interesting to me. And it said, why Europe axed its wealth taxes. By the oh, way, what a word. Axed. Yeah. I mean, that is pretty brutal, dude. I believe axed. That. I'm going to start using that. This is why we axed this idea. Continue. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, what was interesting about that, for some of you guys paying attention, is that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren have proposed essentially wealth taxes and i was looking at that and said no oh, it's well because and just full disclosure anyone not familiar with the national review they are a very conservative leaning publication i mean here are the top stories anti-trump psychodrama fbi's foreign surveillance program uh and south park gives the nba listen to stand up with the china however they link to a study from an organization to take a deeper look at that so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at what warren's proposing what Sanders is proposing, uh, a little bit what Yang's proposing. Yang isn't proposing any kind of wealth tax. He is propo proposing more transactional transactional taxes as opposed to wealth, and he explains why he thinks that's a good idea. So we're going to take a look at those three things. Yeah, and without giving away like my opinions on this, I, I want you to pay very close attention between these two because I really fear the class warfare that has generated um, a hatred of the wealthy in our country. When oftentimes the wealthy and their ideas and their entrepreneurship is something that should be emulated and heralded as a success story of the American dream. Okay. However, there's nothing more than all of us hate than people that use their wealth for greedy, self serving reasons. Okay. But this class warfare has to go. And two of these plans, in my opinion, are the absolute epitome of class warfare and just a general hatred of the rich akin to like all the Joker's followers. Okay. That just wanted to, you know, quote, kill the rich, as it said in the movie. Um, the other one is based off of a consumption and see if you can figure out which one is which our earliest and most effective effective taxes in this country have been consumption based tax where you tax what people consume, not what they make, because you want to not punish making income and, and actually working or else you're just going to breed an unsuccessful lazy society. So anyway, keep going with these three plans and keep your eyes out as you're listening for what this is choosing to tax, whether it's consumption or whether it's just possessions. All right. So keep going, Cody. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, first one, first one we'll take a look at is uh, from Bernie Sanders. He calls it his tax on extreme wealth. Uh, so we'll go through. Now he had pictures of details, but yada, yada, yada. Don't have time to read all this. If you want, I'll have the link in the description. However, here's when it gets to how would it work? So uh, this tax on extreme wealth would have a progressive rate structure that would apply to the wealthiest 180,000 households in America. Top 0.1%, similar with Warren, you'll see. Uh, it would start with a 1% tax on net worth above $32 million for a married couple. That means a married couple with $32.5 million would pay a wealth tax of just $5,000. Okay, but that is the lowest one. Yes, that yeah. is the lowest. The, 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 the tax <laughs> okay. rate would increase to 2% on net worth from 550 to $250 million. 3% from 250 to 500, 4%, and it just keeps going up to eventually, you get a rate of 8% on wealth over 10 billion. Now, the key word here Jeez. is the word that it is wealth. This isn't income. This isn't cash on hand. This isn't revenue even. It's it's wealth, and it's hard to establish wealth. We'll get to that later because there's a lot of things that are considered wealth which are hard to tax, and we're trying to find out ways to tax them. And this one, one way that Bernie Sanders is proposing, and then Really quickly, I'll take you guys over to Elizabeth Warren's, which she calls her ultra millionaire tax. So two very different, not very different, but uh, so far I prefer the ultra millionaire tax to the tax on extreme wealth. I don't know. What do you, what do you prefer, Cardin, of the two names? 
Just naming wise, who who do you think did a better oh, job branding? Ultra, I'll tell you right now, the SJW inside of me prefers the ultra millionaire tax because I feel like I'm punishing the rich that I'm jealous of. Well, Bernie's too, right? The uh, tax on extreme wealth, but uh, yeah, but it's too long, and it doesn't vilify a person. See, the ultra millionaire tax vilifies a person, and it's a lot more fun when you can actually vilify a person and punish that person through taxation. Whereas when you're vilifying the actual wealth itself, now nah, well, all of us want wealth. You know what I'm saying? That's why we're taxing for it. So um, I think from uh, you know trying to gin up the base, trying to get the activists on board and stuff like that, the ultra millionaire tax is a much better brand, a much better brand of uh, you know Antifa esque. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think it does a better job of burying the lead as the wealth tax because that's basically what she's doing here. Yeah. Anyway, because we get down to what Elizabeth Warren's proposing. Again, she provides a lot of reasons for why she would want to do it. Oh, let's go past it. Um, I just go past it. Uh, here we go. So essentially, what Elizabeth Warren would like to do with her ultra millionaire tax is um, would tax the wealth and the richest Americans. You'll notice it's very similar to Bernie Sanders here. Uh, however, her starts with a net worth of fifty million of more per household. Again, not per individual. Uh, so roughly the the. Roughly the wealthiest 75,000 households, the top 0.1%, very similar. Um, hers a little bit thriftier, I guess. It'd be a 2% tax rate in every dollar of net worth above 50 million and a 3% tax rate on every dollar of net worth above 1 billion. Uh, it's not... Also, I, I have to say, just... I don't think either one will work, full disclosure. I prefer the way Warren's going about it with it just kind of like two larger bands. This Bernie Sanders thing, right? The progressive tax that goes all the way from a 2% or a 1% to 10 based on 8%. I don't know. See, I'm already lost in the numbers. Yeah. I think that'd be way harder to enforce and it's way easier to gamify getting from perhaps 4 5.8 billion to 4.75. You can game that. I know it's almost a billion dollars, but you know what I mean to take a tax at. I don't know. I don't want to get too lost in the numbers or if it's worth it. However, well, the other thing, though, is that this is this is what concerns me. OK, let's just say I invent a better, safer, a better airbag for cars that saves hundreds of thousands of lives. I get the patent for it. I've invested um, instead of buying a new house like my father, instead of buying a new house with a nest egg that him and my mother had saved up, they, they put that money down to start our company. They, they, they sacrificed purchasing a new house in order to start a company with me, okay? And they still haven't gotten that investment back. They will sooner or later, but I mean, we're nine years out now in our company and they still haven't. So it's been a long-term investment that I sure had something to do with me being their son and everything. But at the end of the day, if I, if I take a lifetime savings like my parents did, and I've invented a better airbag that's gonna save hundreds of thousands of lives nationwide, and I put it into that airbag, and let's just say I make $10 million, okay? Great, and I wanna retire. Elizabeth Warren's going to call me a bad person, okay? And then on top of that, she wants to come after me and 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 take 3% of my wealth every year or whatever that percentage is. Well, after 10 years, how much has she taken from me? Not 30% because technically my wealth has gone down every time she takes a, a slice out of it for the next year. But, but really, is she entitled, just because I'm a bad person for having invent invented a better airbag that saves lives, to a quarter of my wealth? Based upon what? That's the reverse of the American dream. I, am, am, am I wrong? Just I, I'm tr not trying to see the, the forest from the trees here, but, but that right there is the biggest... Like, there's no incentive for me to invent that airbag if thinking, you know, I could just go work as an engineer for 20 years at this firm and make the same amount of money. Um. I would just argue that that's not my primary issue with the wealth tax at all, is what I would say. I okay, guess. what is it? Um, we'll get into that. First, I don't okay. want to bury the lead here. So, okay. did European countries stop using the wealth tax? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, oh, hold on. I'll move my face so you guys can actually see a little bit better. Uh, oh, hold on. I'll move it. Anyway, uh, I don't want to bury the lead. Yes, they did. So, uh, this is a study by the OECD. Forgot what it stands for. However, it is a multinational organization based in Paris, France, that I believe comprises 39 countries. Uh, you will see, I believe, the starting number. I apologize. It starts over here in 1990 on the far left. At one point, there was 12 countries that are members of the OECD that had levied some kind of individual net wealth tax. They varied, but some kind. And we could see over the last 30-ish years that has declined to returning to its all-time low of roughly three. So... We have roughly three countries, so what is that, a 75% hit from how many used to levy this kind of tax yeah. over how many who did uh, just 30 years ago. Now, I always I mean, say but this. look at that. But we'll bring it up. It's important to remember that these 12 countries in Europe and America are not the same thing. I just want to be fair there. 
However, it is a little bit interesting that you would see that from Europe. Now, before we get a little bit too far into the study, the study found a couple other interesting things, a lot of things that we've heard echoed by other people. Uh, now, the main... I, if, 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 if you disagree, let us know in the comments. I believe Yang's main approach to trying to fix the same inequality we see in wealth... Because um, not all wealth inequality is bad, but sometimes there's some stuff we can kind of correct a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, he has his value added tax. We've gone over the value added tax ad nauseum on this channel. You can probably watch four videos on it. Yeah. We'll go through it. Essentially, uh, easiest way for me to phrase it is a uh, transax trans transactional transaction tax. Yes. So while a lot of things that uh, I mean value added is a great way of putting it. Uh, while a lot of major corporations, because one way of saying is I'm going to tax the individual who owns the stock in the billion dollar company. To get the money from the company and one way to do it is i'm going to tax the transactions that company makes and get the money from the company because then I mean, essentially it seems like it's the same way amazon google these massive corporations i mean how many individuals realistically have net worths in the billions right we're talking about a yeah. few people here uh you can either tax the individual or just get money from the things they own that generate the wealth yeah. i think is the, the the main difference here um but he says as president implement a 10 percent value added tax which is half of the european level and over time, the VAT will become more and more important to capture the value generated by automation. I'll have linked this in the description. We've gone over it before, but that's the main differences. So I wanted to highlight before we get too far forward the between Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and Andrew Gang, how they're planning on kind of fixing some of these massive stores of wealth that are happening in large corporations mostly. Uh, I, again, I think you brought up a really good point there. How you'll notice Andrew Gang talks more about Amazon makes a lot of money. Well, Elizabeth Warren, and uh, a little bit unfair for her. I don't, know, I don't know as much, but Bernie Sanders for sure says billionaires make too much money. And you'll notice, I think it's really interesting, like you brought up. Andrew Yang isn't saying, hey, Jeff Bezos. He's like, no, nah, the guy's playing the game, making money. Amazon is doing things it shouldn't be, right? Like, there's a there's yeah. separation there where you did bring up what I thought was interesting. They have a, There seems to be some people have this kind of correlation between it's not the company ran by many different people doing the things. It's the billionaire at the top who's the problem, so... Um, got off topic there, but I thought that was really interesting the way you kind of phrased that where you'll notice the value added tax isn't as interested. Now, why did they bring that up? Well, because 140 countries worldwide, including all European countries, levy some kind of value added tax. Again, yeah. Europe and the rest of the world in America, very different places. Um, I just wanted to kind of highlight right off the bat uh, here a little bit that you'll notice that what Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are proposing isn't exactly new. In 1990, we had 12 countries out of 36 in this organization using it. And now three of the 12 use it. And we'll go back to the study and, and I'll show you some of the findings. The findings, if you're a big wealth tax person, weren't great. Um, so now that we got that out of the way, uh, you went to what you didn't like a lot about the value, uh, about what wealth taxes are difficult and hard to. Well, th this is my question for you, Cody. Yeah. Uh, when they IPO'd Facebook and it went from being a private company to being a public company, okay, and all of that money from the stock revenue was made and divided amongst the executives. Mark Zuckerberg got his billions. And, you know, the top 10 of those executives all got hundreds of millions of dollars. And there was one of them. You can look this up. There was one of them. I mean, they were all escaping with paying the least amount of taxes possible. One of them went so far as to renounce his U.S. citizenship. Straight up say, I am no longer American. I forfeit my passport. I live in Singapore and my house in LA is a rental. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you can go so far in loopholing wealth taxes as just plain old declaring you're no longer an American. Like all the companies that move to Ireland do. They basically say, oh, we're no longer American. And our New York headquarters, those are no longer uh, international headquarters. The, the headquarters are in Ireland and we're, we're just renting here. You know, it's it's an absolute joke. And what people don't realize is when you go down this road of vilifying the wealthy, you never punish the wealthy, but you do punish all the people that um, have all the people that benefit from it. And, and, and also you, you punish entrepreneurialism when you uh, and, and eliminate the profit incentive. Okay, yes, I, I think Big Pharma has played too many games, okay? And they have not had an ethical approach to the development of their drugs. So let's let's enforce a more ethical approach to the development of their drugs. But let's not just punish Big Pharma for being Big Pharma and say that you can't make money making drugs or else what incentive does Big Pharma have to develop a better cure for cancer? Honestly, why? If you're going to lose all the money you make, why do it in the first place? And that's, that's literally what Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are, are, are suggesting here. They're vilifying the wealthy, one of them going so far as to name their tax against 
a wealthy class of people, regardless of how they got their money. You know, um, but let's just say I did invent a better airbag that s saved hundreds of millions of lives over a decade worldwide. I, I don't think um, the average American has a problem with the inventor of a better airbag that saves lives making a hundred million dollars compared to somebody who made it doing, I don't know, you know, uh, backdoor deals that caused bubbles in the stock market that led to the economic collapse of micro economies in the northeastern seaboard. Yeah, we don't like that guy. OK, but she's literally taxing him the same. And, and, and that's not fair because one also may have a very generous lifestyle that's helping others dealing with 501c3, so on and so forth. And the other one may have a very selfish lifestyle that's consuming more and not giving back to a society. So what does that tell us? You have to tax the consumption. You've got to tax the consumption and the VAT is what it's a it's a consumption tax because if not and you make it a wealth tax, then there's always going to be a loophole at the end of the day. This is my question for you, Cody. What's keeping the rich from just escaping from Bernie Sanders and uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren's tax plan? What's keeping them from pulling a Facebook and just plain old renouncing well, their citizenship well, I, and saying, oh, I live in Ireland now? Well, I think the biggest thing that you're perhaps missing here, which is what I want to get into. The biggest thing about why wealth taxes probably aren't used anymore in a lot of countries in Europe that used to use them and why Andrew Yang is not for them. Uh, it's less the, it's less the, 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 the morality of it. Well, it's like it's not morality. It's not, it's not the, the number. They don't work because one yeah. thing you keep missing and you're talking about it, it's a wealth tax. If I own song rights to a musician no one cares about and some movie buys them off me for dirt cheap because I don't I don't care. Yeah, really how cheap, do you quantify and it? And that movie becomes an Academy Award winner. It's the biggest movie in the country and suddenly my song rights go from being worth almost nothing to being a very massive portfolio of song rights. How do you tax that? And the wealth tax aims to tax that by saying, well, now that those song rights that you have the rights to are worth X, you owe us money on X. And it's like, well, hold on a minute. I literally sold them to one, I leased them to one movie for a little bit of money because I don't, they weren't more worth anything then. Now they're worth a lot, but I don't make that money. I just have an asset. And what I'm going to show you right now is this was that OEC inve OECD study they did on. Well, I think you and I are both saying the exact same thing. I, I'm saying well, no, if you could just renounce your citizenship and there's, there's always a way to get out of it, it doesn't work. And then you're just saying no, it hasn't worked. No, so both is, of us are saying it doesn't work. Is, the main issue is that you can't necessarily always properly quantify wealth on a level you could tax. Here okay. were some of the main uh, issues they found in their study. Because again, this, 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 this board did a study. Why did we all stop using this, right? Here are some of the main negatives. And the big ones I want to point to is that it penalizes the low holders of low return assets. That's a huge thing. Yeah. Like I was trying to, I think I had a bad example of it. Just because I have an asset that is worth something. Like I said, if I have songs that are now worth so much, nobody even bothers asking me to use them because they're, there's just too much money. Yeah. I Nobody's going to be renting that song for you And I don't make any money, but I'm getting yeah. tax on it at that level until it eventually recedes. And I think that's just one issue, but there's a lot of things to that. Well, that what you pointed to, which is the other main thing, valuation and compliance issues. You could do things to intentionally devalue your company in a kind of like, you know, like there's things like public trust, for example, I believe is something when you sell businesses will be in there. Right? Yeah. How much does the community respect you? You could tank that. It doesn't actually lower the value of your company, lowers your tax rates. Again, shenanigans. And then uh, the other big issue they had was liquidity issues, which you pointed out. Wealth isn't money. So if I own a company yeah. worth X and it's worth, you know, $3 billion, oh my God, I own this massive company, but I don't have anywhere near that. And they tax me at three billion dollars. Like, well, hold on a minute. I don't actually have three billion dollars. You know, so a perfect. Those are the big problems they found. I just wanted to highlight. Yeah. Well, a perfect example of what you're saying is one of my first experiences with wealth from assets was in sixth grade. My friends and I had gotten into baseball cards, and I had found at a garage sale like this, you know, flat of baseball cards from like 1989 or whatever it was, and there was an original Mark Gibson card in there. Okay, he was a big homer guy for I believe the the A's, right? And he played for the Oakland Athletics, right? Mark Gibson. What year was that? Not Kurt Gibson. Mark Kurt Gibson. Gibson played. Were well, you thinking of Mark McGuire? He played for the Oakland Athletics around when you were a kid. Yeah, uh, I can't remember if it was Mark McGuire. If it was, no, it was Kirk. Uh, well, okay, look, it was big baseball. Kirk player. Gibson was a rookie in like the seventies, I believe. So I don't know if it was okay. Kirk Gibson. It was, I just remember there was a year that he smashed a bunch of homers, and and I remember we had Beckett magazines, which were this baseball trading card magazine, in which in the back there was this big section of all the different years the baseball cards came out and what they were worth. And a common card was worth eight cents. 
a rare card they'd say was worth like eight dollars it was almost like a blue book for cars but for baseball cards right and i remember i took this little flat home that i got from the garage sale and i pulled it out and i got the flat for five bucks and i pulled it out and i said dad look the beckett you know like this card is worth eight dollars and he said how do you know it's worth eight dollars and i said well right here in beckett magazine it says it's worth eight dollars and he looked at me and he said carden could you go sell that to one of your friends for eight dollars and i said no they don't have eight dollars and he said then that card is not worth eight dollars because things are only worth what people are willing to spend purchasing them so the beckett was totally wrong <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And the Beckett would be the equivalent of whatever bureaucrat is going to be measuring their wealth in order to tax it. You know what I'm saying? Just like you say, if your songs all of a sudden, you know, increase in value. Yeah, according to what? I can't go sell them for that much. You know, and your estimated value arbitrarily based upon what data is determining how much money I have to pay you. You know, because let me tell you. I, I, you can fudge the numbers on your side, but I can't fudge the numbers on mine. If you say I owe you a hundred million dollars, I better come up with a check for a hundred million dollars or else you're putting me in jail. Whereas I can't do that to somebody who wants to buy my songs. I can't say, oh, sorry, this is worth a hundred million dollars as an asset. And now that you've expressed interest, you are obligated to purchase it for that value or else I'm going to put you in debtor's prison. You, you can't do that. You know what I'm saying? No, yeah, I mean, like I said, like, just because I can borrow against something doesn't mean it actually I can get the money today. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. It's one of the reasons why people will borrow against assets because they're like, well, I, I can't exactly make this money today. Uh, but before I get too too deep off in this video, okay. um, I wanted to get to the main conclusions from this OECD study. Okay. And this is what they said. So the main conclusions were there's a strong case for addressing wealth inequality through the tax system relevant to us, but this does not necessarily require a net worth tax. A, there's a weaker case for a net worth tax on top of broad-based capital income taxes, which I believe we have in the United States. Okay. Would you agree with that, Cardin? To be frank, I'm not the tax expert in the U.S. Oh, Would my Would you gosh. agree we have some kind of broad-based capital income tax and a well-designed inheritance and gift tax? Uh, well-designed? Okay, you can't escape the estate tax, which is when you die. You can't escape the capital in uh, capital gains, it's called here. In the, uh, in the U.S. In fact, we have so many of these dumb little loophole laws that, that people will actually stay in houses for longer just to avoid the capital gains tax. They'll stay in jobs they hate, in communities that are dangerous, just because they don't want to sell until that 24 months has been up. You know what I'm saying? To avoid that 14% capital gains tax. It's absolutely pathetic. So, so we have more than a well-designed tax system. We have a, a well-designed, implemented, and squeezing the middle class tax system out there. Just fine. It's perfect. Trust me. Okay, so so th so then you you would agree, perhaps like even according. It seems like even the OECD would agree. Then perhaps in the United States, a net worth tax would also not make a lot of sense. Uh, I, so I just like I wanted to go through that. I want to take a look at those three uh, very different candidates' um, plans for addressing. I want to say I guess addressing wealth inequality is one way of saying it. I would just say kind of get that money into the tax system. That's kind of like I know taxes are very high, but one of the reasons why they have to keep raising taxes is because no one pays them. So like you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if I'm only getting twenty percent of what I'm actually charging you, like I have to make it five times higher because yeah. that's the only way I can get what I need. So I, I think it's really interesting seeing how um, we're seeing candidates in America today proposing something that was a good idea in Europe thirty years ago. No one uses anymore. That's kind of weird. Uh, we're seeing candidates like Andrew Yang explain. In the same terms that we saw the OECD, I mean, basically, a, 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 a pull up, it was a, I think it's 36 countries, independent uh, board, they study like finances and economies in Europe. Yeah. All, they had to do a study, like why do, why do we go from a third of our countries using it to four out of 30, like no one uses it, why? They did the study and they found a lot of the same stuff that Andrew Yang's saying now, and it's really weird to me to see both Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, because... They're pushing very similar to the same thing. The only real difference, this is Elizabeth Warren right here. It is a, uh, so what would it be? It'd be 2% tax in every dollar above 50 million, 3% tax in every dollar above 1 billion. So like, that's basically pretty simple. And then Bernie's is much more progressive. It keeps moving, I believe, from 35 to 10 billion. It really kind of steps down there. But again, they both talk about wealth. And well, we've noticed countries don't like taxing on wealth anymore because one, either no one pays yeah. Or there's so many games and shenanigans, it's impossible to actually properly ass assess the wealth. Or you have people sitting on assets that accrue wealth that don't actually, they don't actually pay anything. Like there's wealth that they're sitting on, and you're taxing people who don't have the money to pay you, and it just becomes an issue. And it seems like what they kind of 
a little bit said there is if you have pretty good capital gains and wealth and inheritance taxes, that's probably the way to go here. Um, well, and, and the perfect example, like just, I'm, I'm just uh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but just to literally give a historical context to what you're talking about, Cody. During the Eisenhower admi administration, our peak tax rate reached 90%. I mean, 90 percent. We were coming out to the American public saying, if you make more than X amount of dollars, we're going to tax you 90 percent unless asterisk, 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 asterisk. And guess what? Nobody paid 90 percent. They all ended up finding whatever asterisk were necessary or falsifying the documentation or whatever until they paid what is the normal taxable rate that settles in between, you know, 10 and 20 percent. OK, I, I mean, if you look at the real amount of money that was taken in and all that does is create disrespect for um, disrespect for law, like one of the biggest problems of prohibition. It's funny, you're approaching this argument from a practical standpoint, I'm approaching it from a moral standpoint. One of my biggest problems with prohibition, even though I'm, I'm not an alcoholic, I, I, I don't like alcohol, I don't like it, what it does to people, I'd rather legalize weed and outlaw alcohol if I could, okay? But at the end of the day, I'm vehemently anti-prohibition because when you prohibit a good, you just create an underground that everybody participates in, a black market that everybody exploits, and when you all of a sudden have everybody exploiting a back black market, what does that do? It creates general disrespect for the law. Because after all, if all of us are boozing on the weekends when that's illegal, why not just break these other laws that are illegal too? And you just create a chaos society instead of a law and order society. So you can't believe in laws and the fundamental necessity thereof and be okay with tax systems that breed a general disrespect for tax law. Does that make sense? I mean, am I going wrong here, Cody? No, I would just disagree. I just think that personally, you can't have morality in tax code. Doesn't matter. What works, works, man. Don't care why it works. Do don't care how it works. Have morality don't care code. who. Because Our whole regressive tax and, and progressive tax scale is based on a morality and an idea that the rich should pay more because they can afford it and the poor should pay less because they that? can't. Do you agree with that? Do you agree that works? Do you think it's effective? Machine? No, no, no. I, I, I don't agree it's effective, because, and I disagree with the morality because, but, of but, it. But, 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 well, okay, but I, I disagree the morality is relevant. It's just if you have something, or I, I disagree if it's immoral or amoral. The idea is when you're putting morality— Is that why you skipped Yom Kippur? No, I'm just saying that— Is like, that why you have not spent all day praying? No, it's because I don't practice. No, but, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I'm just saying that like when you're trying to build a math-based system, you really can't get the morals in there. Just what numbers work. Now, the morals might dictate your end goal. That's going to change, right? Because— but th when it gets into actually making the system, you can't say if we want if we want this outcome and this is how we get there. You can't say, but is it moral to do this? In taxes, for the most part, it's probably not moral. So what are you going to do? Yeah. You're going to just not have any taxes ever? You know what I mean? Yeah, so, all the libertarians are throwing their shoes at the screen saying, taxation is theft! Th my, taxation is theft! My point exactly. So you kind of have to just put the morals out of it, I believe, and you have to use the morals to kind of decide your end goal. But when the, the, the machinations, how you get there, it's just got to be what math works. Now, obviously, you don't want to do anything that puts, you know, that like ruins people's life. At a certain point, the human beings have to step in and say, the math can't dictate everything. But I do think that if you want a system that actually achieves its goal again this is a thing i had not looked at from andrew gang i know By finance the way, just before you continue i'd like to say excellent use of the word machinations oh thank you i always thought it was machinations probably is but um oh, okay anyway <laughs> yeah <laughs> still that's awesome yeah. i haven't heard that word since like you know eighth grade history in english so yeah, that was pretty just, cool you know, the internals but anyway <laughs> there's something i think is interesting from andrew gang i know obviously we're andrew gang people so it's like uh warren and sanders boo but i think this was interesting and i do think it addresses more the soul of the issue um, like I said, finance people are going to hammer me. I don't know a ton about this, but I like this. So he's proposing a financial transax transaction tax. Um, and essentially what he's proposing here, it's a 0.1% financial transaction tax that would raise as much as $50 billion per year, yada, yada, and used to help fund universal basic income. That's all great. Mm. I, I prefer when it comes to all these you know, finance people, the money executives, the movers, the big, the 1%, right? I think a more effect effective way is not trying to get the end not at the end of the year, we're coming for ours. Government, why not take point one off the top of every single transaction made? People moving money around. People, yeah. Banks do it. Well, why can't the federal government step in and say, hey, look, man, if you're going to be moving your stocks, moving your shares, moving your assets, moving all this stuff around the market. I think Andrew actually mentions in here at one point in his thing that, uh, yeah, investing has been transformed into speculation by computer-generated algorithms and trading platforms. The average holding time of a stock is now four months. There is no real value being... so." Why doesn't the government just get its piece when that stock moves hands three times a year? Just give the government its 0.1% piece. It's not gonna it's not gonna break any bank. Oh, yeah, finance people are gonna kill me. It's like, you, know, you don't we, know our margins are 0.1%. But I'm just saying that I think that is a more rational way than saying 
saying during the process of you accruing this wealth, just give us our piece, I think is more rational than they come at the end of the year and say, here's your bill, pay us 3%. I think it's more rational to say, just give us a little bit of everything you do and then we'll leave you alone at the end of the year more. Yeah, um, we're actually going to do a policy video on this. So before I dive into everything I want to say about that, I'll save it for the pol policy video. But the Reader's Digest version is, um, I just don't know how that tax would stay out of the hands of people that want to put it elsewhere. The biggest problem about passing taxes is that they can always be rerouted. Just like a river can be rerouted, you can always reroute the flow of money into something stupid that I didn't agree on. And a perfect example is how on our cell phone bills, we're still paying taxes that were levied in the 1840s and the 1850s to help with the telegraph poles um, that, you know, had had uh, replaced the Pony Express because the Indians had supposedly, you know, stolen those glass insulators and we created a fund for it that ended up continuing in its 20th permutation into the, uh, the the modern iteration that's showing up on our cell phone bill. And it's that extra eight bucks that we got to pay on every cell phone bill. And it's like, wait, you know, I never agreed to this. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like my great, 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 great grandpa already paid for whatever insulators needed to get replaced. Why do you just get to co-opt this and perpetuate it when I didn't agree to perpetuate it? So anyway, um, let us know what you guys think. Uh, let us know what you think about all three tax plans. If you haven't had a chance to like the video, please like and subscribe. Um, comment below and we can try and get back to you as much as we can. This is a very, very data deep video. So try and supply any kind of links that you can to any comments you have. And uh, make sure you join us on Tuesdays and Thursdays for our live stream where we talk all of this that's going on politically right now. This is Problem Solver Politics. We'll see you guys in the next video.